Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure to be a moderator of this, uh, I think, uh, important session on 360 thrombosis. This is a series of events which is um, endorsed by Emirate Cardiac Society. And this time tonight is by Bayer sponsoring this event, which is going to uh, tackle atrial fibrillation and DVT. And we have two great speakers. Um, we all know them and we see them in practice in many meetings, Dr. Mohammed Salah and Dr. Mohammed Tariq. So uh, we're gonna start with Dr. Mohammed Salah. He's a consultant cardiologist from New Kalba Hospital. And he will talk, focus on atrial fibrillation diabetes, focusing on renal preservation perspective. Dr. Mohammed, we're looking forward to your topic, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this nice introduction. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, the buyer for uh, inviting me to share in this uh, scientific event. Of course, I'd like to thank the Emirates Society of Cardiology uh, for sharing this event. And of course, my dear colleague, Dr. Abdallah Shahab, which I like to see him always. And as you heard from Dr. Shahab, I will uh, speak today about the atrial uh, fibrillation uh, and diabetes mellitus, where, and will emphasize over, uh, concentrate over the renal preservation. Can you see my slide now? Yes, we see. Okay, so uh, let's start. So the topics today, we are just going to speak about the AFib and diabetes case with focus on renal preservation uh, perspective. As we know, atrial fibrillation is the one of the commonest arrhythmia. And we can see that the prevalence of atrial uh, fibrillation in US is about more than 2.2 million adults with the incidence more than 70,000. The unfortunately, the prevalence increased steadily with age. As you can see, the diabetes and atrial fibrillation are frequently occur together. More than 30% of patients with AFib have diabetes, and the 15% of patients with diabetes has also diabetes have also also have atrial fibrillation. What is the uh, uh, the worst uh, dream about the, the combination of AFib and diabetes mellitus? As we can see, patients with diabetes mellitus and atrial fibrillation have a significantly higher risk of cardiovascular event and all cause, mort cause mortality in compared to patients with diabetes mellitus without atrial fibrillation. So this is very uh, uh, nasty and serious complication. And you have to do all your effort to choose the agent that can show reduction or prevention of occurrence of this cardiovascular death from the uh, direct oral anticoagulant. Again, renal impairment is common among the atrial fibrillation patient. And we can see in three patients with AFib have chronic, has chronic kidney disease. And the patient with AFib and the chronic kidney disease are higher incidence to develop bleeding and stroke or systemic or thromboembolism. And even uh, renal function progressively increase with older age. Here is the, uh, the triad that it is dangerous triad. As we can see, the atrial fibrillation, kidney disease, and diabetes, all of them, they are associated with high incidence increase the risk of a stroke, ranging from about five times to fold increase. And the chronic kidney disease associated with 30 to 60% increase the risk of stroke. And the baddest, uh, the worst type of stroke that appear in atrial fibrillation is we have it is ischemic stroke. 90% of the stroke in the, uh, with atrial fibrillation are ischemic stroke. And ischemic stroke has very bad impact on the society, on the family, and on the patient, and they carry high risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And as we can see, diabetes cardiovascular risk and renal function are closely interrelated to each other. Patients with type 2 diabetes and the kidney disease also have increased the risk of cardiovascular mortality and diabetes. So unfortunately, this combination or this comorbid condition are associated with high incidence of cardiovascular morbidity and the mortality. So how can we tackle this thing? I'm going to uh, show, uh, sh share with you today one case which is a common in our region in the Northern Emirates. This is Mrs. RF, RM, eight years female patient, presented to ER with a complaint of feeling unwell, an ear fainting experience, and the surgeon anxious. Her medical history, hypertension for eight years, and non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus for 10 years. When we examine her, we find that she has atrial fibrillation, which is symptomatic. She's obese also, and her heart rate 120 beat per minute. Her echo shows that ejection fraction 50%, sclerotic mitral valve, CT done to exclude any injury or stroke. 
and she has uh, renal impairment. Her creatinine clearance was 30 milliliter per minute. She was in this uh, medication. So as we can see, this type of patient that you are seeing is a very complicated patient and a very high risk to develop a stroke. She's old age, hypertension, diabetes, and she has chronic renal impairment, which makes her, and this is her ECG, when we saw it in ER, this is her atrial fibrillation. So when you saw a patient like that in ER, you have to ask about yourself many important questions. The first question, you have to make what is called risk stratification of this patient. Why? Because according to the, when you make the risk stratification, this lead you to use what shoes or the, the medication that should be suitable for this kind of patient. The risk stratification occur about that you have to know the shad vasca score in this patient with atrial fibrillation. And of course, this patient, her shad vasca score, it's about four or more even. And the higher the shad vasca score, the higher the incidence of stroke. Again, you have to look for the what we call has blood score to see the incidence of bleeding. And this patient has yeah, her has bled almost three. So she has very high risk to develop stroke and very high risk to develop bleeding. Then when you see this patient, you have your scalp, how to protect the hair from development of stroke or bleeding, uh, mainly from stroke. This is the most important thing. So most of the cases or some physician till now, um, first you have to, what we call to make modification or the associated cardiovascular Com comorbidity associated with diabetes, like to control the blood pressure and to eliminate the exercise, cholesterol management, diabetes prevention, smoking session, and anticoagulation for treatment of atrial fibrillation. One should say, or some, some doctor tell now, they will use, they said, oh, she's old age with this all uh, risk factor, I will give her aspirin. No way. This is absolutely wrong and it is already obsolete. And this is a guideline since 2016, antibiotic monotherapy as aspirin is not recommended for stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation patient, regardless of stroke risk. And even the uh, NICE guideline, don't offer aspirin monotherapy slowly for stroke prevention to people with atrial fibrillation. So please, please, if somebody think about this or he is in mind, ignore it. It's not recommended. Again, so we have another tool. We have the uh, vitamin K antagonist, warfarin. And warfarin is the, the drug that had been used for so many decades, and it should. It, it, it shows us that 60, 67% risk reduction of stroke and the 26% risk reduction of the death. So it is a very strong drug, a powerful drug. However, still we have some limitation for vitamin K antagonists. The worst limitation is the narrow therapeutic window INR. It has enormous drug-drug interaction, enormous food-drug interaction, and what is the nightmare? Repeated sampling and the frequent dose adjustment. So therefore, Yes, you can use the vitamin K antagonist, but you have to put in your mind all these limitation and you have uh, share your patient, your choice for the anticoagulation. Then since uh, uh, 2010, 2011, it started to have a new drug of uh, a new group of drug called direct oral anticoagulant. We have uh, three drugs or three types, uh, uh, dabigatram, which was showed in July 2009. We have rivaroxaban, rocket atrial fibrillation study in 2010, and we have abixaban, and which was uh, studied in the Aristotel. All the are large three randomized uh, clinical trial. And on all these trials, you showed that it was a very uh, nice uh, surprise uh, for us that they are, all of them show they are as effective as warfarin in reduction of stroke systemic embolization with some superiority for an um, abixaban uh, uh, for the bigatram, 150 milligram. So they are safe for the reduction of stroke or systemic embolization. Also, they are, uh, they are efficacy and they are safe because they are associated with less incidence of bleeding in comparison to warfarin. So now we have a drug that they are a group of drugs that are very strong and they are effective as warfarin, even superior than warfarin, why we don't use these drugs for these patients. So let us see what are the guidelines after all these trials said. This is a new 2020 guideline from uh, ASCC guideline, and they introduced a new terminology, what we call ABC pathway. Of course, we'll not talk about it today, but let us concentrate about the anticoagulation and avoid stroke and comorbidity and the cardiovascular uh, vector management. In 2016, the guideline mentioned that, and in 2020, they said that in class 1A, stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation patient, no work are recommended in the presence to, in preference to vitamin K, class 1A recommendation. Recently, they said you have to make, as I said, risk assessment to check the shad vasque score. However, shad vasque score zero in men or one in women 
you shouldn't offer antithrombotic therapy. However, if shared vascular score more than 10 in men or more than three in women, this is class 1A. So as I said, shared VASC is very important and you have to make risk stratification of your patient. Even the high bleed, high bleeding risk alone, if you have high bleed, is not a reason to withhold the anticoagulation. Always be a strong heart. Don't be afraid to give the work to protect your patient from the occurrence of a stroke. If we look to the, uh, the three-phase trial or all this trial, uh, we are going to see that the in rocket FM trial, the is uh, contain high instance, high prevalence of patient with high cardiovascular risk. They are they have diabetes. My 40% of the uh, of the population have diabetes. More than 91% uh, have hypertension, congestive heart failure. 62 patient has previous strokes. They have 55% with moderate renal impairment. 21%. So in in, in all this trial they studied this kind of patient. But if we look to the, uh, the kind of patient and their incidence and their prevalence, we found that the high risk patients, they are very high rocket atrial fibrillation. So if it studied rocket F, uh, rocket FM had higher risk of stroke than patient in other uh, phase three trial with no one. So that's why when you choose a shut bus and you know high risk, you have to think about which the direct oral anticoagulant that you are going to use. Let us see now. And if we look again at rocket FM, we can find that Patient, they have the shad vascular score with very shad vascular score with very high and rocket FM about three to six, 87% in comparison to other phase three trial. Even the has related score was higher. So this is means that we are dealing with high risk patient. When you are dealing with high risk patient, all the direct current coagulant are effective, but you have to choose what is the best or what that kind of direct current coagulant that fit for this patient. Choose always the right the work for the right patient, this is the golden rule. This is the rocket atrial fibrillation and patient with diabetes mellitus. And as we can see, this is subgroup analysis. And the conclusion said that there are similar rate of efficacy and safety outcome of patient for with and without diabetes mellitus. And this result supports the use of rivaroxaban as an effective alternative to warfarin for a stroke fibrillation in patient with atrial fibrillation with or without diabetes mellitus. This is very important point. Second thing, I told you that uh, one of the worst complication for atrial fibrillation and diabetes mellitus is the cardiovascular disc and the vascular disc. If we look here in record FM, rivaroxaban showed consistent safety and efficacy compared to warfarin in NAF patient with diabetes mellitus. I want you to emphasize about this vascular disc. Vascular disc significantly reduced in favor of rivaroxaban in comparison to warfarin. And mind you always that the main line, baseline shot vascular score was 3.7 for diabetic and 3.3 for non-diabetic patient. So this is important point. And as we know, diabetes in general, 65% of diabetes is related to cardiovascular disease. So if you have a, a, the chance to decrease the incidence of cardiovascular disease or vascular disease, this is, of course, it's a great achievement, which we have it in the uh, rocket effect by using rivaroxaban. And again, if we, uh, of course, there is no head-to-head -head trial, but if we look at three trials, I look at FM Aristotle, relay trial, we can, the cardiovascular deaths are significantly reduced in favor of rivaroxaban in comparison to other three. They reduce, but the significant reduction occur or many reduction occur in cardiovascular deaths and rocket FM with rivaroxaban, 20 milligram. Okay, what other fear? She's always the patient with diabetes, they have come to fear of limb amputation. This is very important, but as we see, we reduce the cardiovascular disc. This is gives the rivaroxaban what we call vascular protective effect. This is very important. So patients with diabetes are feared with amputation almost as much as blindness or this. However, if we look in this trial, major adverse limb event in atrial fibrillation patients with diabetes are in favor of rivaroxaban in comparison to what we have in warfarin alone. So this is another vascular protective effect, which is a very important point to be uh, remembered always, always when you deal with your patient. This is another uh, real world data, which is so the effectiveness and safety of rivaroxaban versus warfarin for prevention of mace and the male in patients with NAF and the type 2 diabetes mellitus. They said to compare the effectiveness and safety of rivaroxaban versus warfarin for prevention of mace and the male in patients with uh, uh, type 2 diabetes and the NAF. What's mean by male? Mace are ischemic stroke or myocardial infarction. Male, it is major amputation or a need for revascularization. And second, the was major bleeding. And as we can see, rivaroxaban 
associated with significant reduction of the mass, mainly ischemic stroke and myocardial infarction, and even the male point major limb amputation, surgical revascularization, and the vascular minor limb amputation was significantly reduced in group of rivoxaban versus warfarin, which proves what we have in the phase three trial. Even the consistent efficacy and safety for patients with diabetes as a reduction of vascular death and stroke has been also seen in the real world data in the study of US DOD, PMS. We can see that the even real world data, even when mean shared vascular score is three, still there is significant benefit and reduction of uh, stroke and the bleeding and the even reduction of even of limb amputation. So this is a very important one. Then Another important question, as we can see, this patient, she has a kind of creatinine clearance with 30 uh, millimeters. So this has a moderate to severe or severe renal impairment. So how to prevent deteriorate her renal function? This is very important also, because as we know that diabetes has from a complication with diabetic nephropathy, atrial fibrillation, all of these together, they produce more deterioration of renal function. So how to prevent the deterioration of her renal function? This is another important question. As we can see, vitamin K antagonist or warfarin may increase the vascular cal calcification. And this by the time cause decline in renal function. So in patient with atrial fibrillation, chronic disease, renal function decline after use of vitamin K exposure versus no vitamin K. And this is occurred by arterial calcification increase in warfarin uh, in comparison uh, that occur with warfarin. So you have to use here the direct oral anticoagulant to avoid this complication. Let us see now. And if we can see in, uh, in um, uh, rocket effect trial, the shared VASC score uh, patient distribution patient with moderate renal impairment creatinine 30 to 49 percent. We can see the mean shot bus score 30.3.7 percent and the high incidence of moderate renal impairment. By the way, in the rocket effect trial, the dose reduced for moderate renal population is 15 millimi, milli, mi, 15 milligram the dose for the uh, river band. And this is you have to remember that this is the only FED, FED do, dose approved for reduction of stroke or prevention of the stroke and uh, occurrence of bleeding in patient with moderate renal impairment in comparison to other DUAC. But a look at a look at FAP, you can see that the consistent result in NAF patient with moderate renal impairment. Again, the efficacy and the safety wise, we have the same beneficial effect as have the effect, very beneficial effect in patient even with moderate renal impairment and diabetes mellitus. Rivaroxaban is the only novel oral anticoagulant with prospective tested specific renal dose in patients with moderate renal impairment. Again, also, all the kind of bleeding are significantly reduced with uh, in favor of rivaroxaban in comparison to warfarin uh, for patients with moderate renal impairment, which gives a chance to, good, to be used as a good alternative there. What about renal preservation? We want, we said that we need to protect from renal deterioration. So let us see now about one uh, world, uh, uh, real world data uh, study, uh, where they use that to compare the effect of all NOAC. We use the abixaban, the bigatran, and the viroxaban with warfarin and renal outcome. And the three important points that use, more than 30% decline in glomerular filtration rate, doubling of serum creatinine, acute kidney injury, and the kidney failure. This is retrospective cohort analysis. And as we can see, this result, the most, uh, most important one shows that significant or the uh, protective, renoprotective effect less than 30% decline in glomerular filtration rate was rivaroxaban, even doubling of serum creatinine rivaroxaban, acute kidney injury rivaroxaban, and uh, kidney failure rivaroxaban. Followed by, if we look after him, we find that the bigatra also show beneficial, some beneficial in the 30% decline in glomerular filtration rate. By all means, all NOAC showed that they are effective in renal protective function. However, the most significant one that show renal protective effect was the rivaroxaban. And this is the, the conclusion from this trial was like that. Compared with warfarin, the use of NOAC, all NOACs was associated with reduced the risk of more than 30% decline in glomerular filtration rate doubling of serum creatinine, acute kidney injury, they are in favor of Novak in comparison to warfarin. However, when we compare each Novak with warfarin, we find, find that rivaroxaban was associated with lower risk of 30% decline, glomerular filtration rate, 
doubling serum creatinine and acute kidney injury. Dabigatram was associated with lower risk of 30% decline, glomerular filtration rate, and acute kidney injury. Apixaban showed that, but it doesn't reach statistically significant with any of renal outcome, which is surprising because uh, we'll know by the time why it is surprising. Okay, again, still we're asking ourselves, is there is a chance to prevent the her kidney and instead to have it replacing them? This is uh, another trial that studied reload, renal functioning, worsening with NOAC versus uh, warfarin or, or the vitamin K antagonist in patient of NAF and renal disease. This happened in Germany. Uh, they are compared the risk of renal function worsening with NOAC versus uh, war, uh, warfarin in patient with NAF and renal disease. They studied both and rivaroxaban and abixaban, and the end point was in the stage renal disease, dialysis, and acute kidney injury. And as we can see, and you know, diabetic patient taking rivaroxaban or abixaban had a statistically significant risk reduction related to end stage renal disease versus vitamin K. However, one of the most important points that makes difference with rivaroxaban, the risk of acute kidney injury. This is very important. The risk of acute kidney injury where only rivaroxaban showed a reduced risk by 28%. So both of them, they are show they have renal protective effect and significant risk reduction to end stage renal disease. However, abixaban was unique for reduction of acute injury, kidney injury by 22%. Mind you, I told you, you have to ask you this question yourself, how to protect her kidney, how to prevent occurrence of deterioration of her renal function. Now the evidence is going, is increasing, and we have more and more evidence. Also, this is uh, another uh, recent trial called the Caliber trial. They are impact, impact of rivaroxaban versus warfarin. Now, here we are gonna, now we saw before all this trial, we saw most of the NOAC, we studied all the NOAC, but we found that rivaroxaban has unique properties in other two trials. Here, they use the link between warfarin and the renovascular calcification as worsening of renal function. So to compare the safety and efficacy of reduced dose, reduced dose war, uh, rivaroxaban, 15 milligram versus warfarin or renal outcome patient with NAF. They would like to do adult with NAF and the stage three, four kidney disease with or without diabetes treated with rivaroxaban or warfarin from January 2012 to, to to 2017. The end point is we have to prevent the progression to kidney stage five, kidney failure, or need for dialysis. And as we can see in the trial, and this trial shows that caliber rivaroxaban reduced the risk of renal worsening renal function versus warfarin in patient with NAF and the stage three to four coronary kidney disease and type two plus or minus type two diabetes mellitus. So this is very important. Now we are going to we prevent the progression to stage of fifth kidney disease, kidney failure, or dialysis. This is very important point because why you are waiting to until the patient reaches to this stage, or you give him a drug that you cannot protect him, or you give him some warfarin that lead to the duration of renal function. So again, reduce dose of rivaroxaban, 15 milligram, significantly reduce the risk of worsening renal function compared to warfarin, irrespective of whether patient has comorbid disease or not with or without diabetes mellitus. And if we look to the EHARA 2018 guideline, NOAC renal insufficiency, we can see that uh, for uh, all of the NOAC can be used when the creatinine clearance are 50 to up to 95. If the creatinine clearance from 30 to 50, we can see that you have to use the reduced dose to, for the dabigatram, two by 150 milligram or two by 100 milligram, rivaroxaban, always 15 milligram, reduxaban 30 milligram, still not yet available. For abixaban, you have to use 2.5 by uh, twice daily. For patient less than 30 or 15, the only one can be used or the three group can be used is rivaroxaban and abixaban. Mind you, and I'm always telling you, mind you, the only approved dose or reduced dose for reduction of the incidence of atrial fibrillation and the stroke in renal and some patient patient is only the rivaroxaban. However, the other yards are being used and tested as we see, but still we don't have the approval for this dose. So always remember and the mind on your mind, what you are going to do? Yes, you, you give the thing to protect the renal function or you are to be in the safe side with reduced dose. However, you increase the risk of, or you expose your patient to the risk of a stroke. So this is very important point. Again, 
Rivaroxaban appears to be associated with similar efficacy and significant less major bleeding versus warfarin. This is a very uh, recent uh, trial, just recently published. Still, as I told you, it is an off label, but at least we can give you idea that what is coming in the future and what will happen in the uh, coming guideline, probably the American guideline, because the European, is, the European society guideline is still, they are very conservative for uh, patients with end stage renal disease. But we can see here, Rivaroxaban appear to associated with similar efficacy, less major bleeding versus warfarin in patients with end stage renal disease. Just to keep it in your mind, I will not touch this too much, it's still uh, off label, but keep it in your mind. There is something going on and the life is going to be changed very soon. Then if we combine this slide demonstrates the combination of all the studies that I mentioned, comparison of renal effect of NOAC and the vitamin K in patients with AFib and the comorbid disease. This is a yeah, subgroup uh, for NOAC versus abixaban, dabigatran, rivaroxaban. As we said, they improve the renal outcome. Another one retrospective, rivaroxaban in end-stage renal disease and dialysis, the improval outcome, and the caliber subgroup analysis prevents the progression of the uh, chronic kidney disease to up to three, uh, for, to stage five or renal failure, this was used in Rivaroxaban. By the time, as we can see, and this we can see from 2019 for ACC, HHR guideline on management of atrial fibrillation, we know that they are still now thinking that the guideline could be changed from their side. Still European 2020, there is no major change about, or still have concern about their end stage renal disease. However, over the time, NOAC, Particularly, you see the newcomer that will be entered, Davigatran and Rivaroxaban, may be associated with a lower risk of adverse renal outcome than warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation. So in summary, renal function in NAF patient decline over the time with age, important to consider comorbidity. NAF and the moderate renal insufficiency, NOAC, are well studied. This is very clear now, perform very well in comparison to warfarin. NAF patient with worsened renal function, oral factor, uh, then inhibitor maintains their efficacy and the safety. In end stage renal disease, NOAC may be a reasonable alternative to warfarin. In particular, now we can see rivaroxaban and abixaban. However, still we have conflicting uh, guidance regarding the recommendation for the use. Another last question that you have to ask me, you, you have to ask me, what about the dosing? Is the safety only include, yeah, you are looking for safety only and you don't like for uh, the only include bleeding, you have to look for the dose. And as we can see, appropriate dosing and the consistent result with different dose of anticoagulation. If we, here is the reduced dose and here is the standard dose. As we can see, for all the other baric oral anticoagulant, when you use the standard dose, Tom Mio, very good. You have, uh, you showed that you have a strong efficacy and safety. However, when reduced dose, wow, you are liable to develop many complications, especially the stroke and bleeding. A stroke is the fear of the most worst complication. So when you use a reduced dose with no evidence, with no base, just only to protect yourself or just to be in safe side, this means that this is very harmful to your patient. The only one so that, as we said, reduced dose proved in patient with renal function with or without diabetes mellitus was 15 milligram. And as we can see, the reduced dose so the same beneficial effect as regard the safety and efficacy. Always put this in your mind because life is going to be changed soon. And even the wrong dose can have serious consequence. If you give a small dose here, Rubik 7 2.5 versus Rubik 7, you find that the incidence of stroke is markedly increased. However, here, the stroke is not increased. No significant difference between the major bleeding. Always, always remember the nightmare, the stroke. Always think about the stroke. Whatever the comorbidity you have, don't look from one point. Yes, I have patient with severe renal impairment and stagional disease, chronic kidney disease stage five, so I will give this drug in reduced dose. But what, uh, what about the occurrence of stroke? What is the protective effect? How about your patient? Always, always remember this point. So let us see, ask ourselves, what does protection mean for you in patient with NAV? What does protection mean? Pre protection means prevention of a stroke, yes, Preserve renal function, right. Might, might getting a bleeding risk, of course. Prevention of cardiovascular death, very important. And we know now who is the only one so that there is a reduction or prevention of cardiovascular death. Protection following stent placement, optimizing in those supporting in address. If you compare all these together, yes, they occur with NOAC, but there is the highly statistically significant protection occur with Rubik's and all these 
uh, uh, endpoints, especially that you have the uh, vascular protection and uh, preventing cardiovascular death. So the take home message is approximately one in every three patients with AFib has comorbid diabetes. Diabetes increased at patient risk of a stroke, cardiovascular death, renal function decline, and the major adverse limb event. In patients with AFib and comorbid diabetes, it is possible to avoid both a reversible macro and the microvascular complication. A choice of anticoagulation is very important. Evidence suggests that patients with AFib and diabetes receiving NOAC have not only a reduced risk of stroke and systemic embolization, but fewer need for limb revascularization, amputation, and experience less clinically relevant renal decline. As I told you, they produce this, this, they produce this effect. However, the most evident one or the, these effects are mostly evident to be prevented with rivaroxaban, especially the cardiovascular death and limb amputation. At the end, thank you so much for your attention, and I hope that uh, the message was clear. Outstanding, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you very much for that overview. I think we have lots of questions and comments. We'll address them, inshallah, at the last 30 minutes. So I'd like to welcome the other, you know, that we have 267 participants so far. Please write your, your comments so we can, you know, all have, you know, uh, discuss this, I think, important uh, issue. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and my friend, Dr. Mohammed Tariq. He's a consultant in internal medicine from Khalifa Medical City, and he will take us to other dimensions. I think it's important to, you know, how to go beyond DVT initial treatment, the extended anticoagulations and, um, and the trials and, uh, you know, the practice tips from Dr. Mohammed. We're looking forward to your topic, Dr. Mohammed. Please. Dr. Tor, uh, Dr. Mohammed, please stop share. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdullah, and thank you for uh, Dr. Muhammad for this uh, elegant, uh, a lot of informative uh, uh, lecture. And uh, uh, I have almost 30 minutes to, to cover very, uh, uh, very really uh, wide subjects, but I'll try to do it in a, in a very simple, practical way. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to try to really present uh, uh, some facts uh, which help uh, us and all practicing physicians to, uh, to decide uh, about uh, extending anticoagulation or not. Uh, so when and why? Uh, so I will start with the clinical case uh, to be really practical. This patient uh, I saw a few months ago uh, in the hospital. This lady, she's a healthy uh, lady without any uh, past medical history, no hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, and uh, she, she takes uh, over, uh, sorry, uh, oral contraceptive uh, pills for her irregular periods. Uh, she presented to a couple of facility before coming to us with progressive shortness of breath, mostly with uh, activity. And uh, she had multiple workup and she was treated with antibiotic one time. She had a workup. She was told that she might need uh, a PCI. Uh, she had echo. So she kept having the symptoms and start getting worse. So she came to our uh, ER. So uh, after full history and physical exam, uh, there was really high suspicion of PE. So uh, cardiac enzyme to agulation panel. Uh, done and it showed like elevated B dimer, chest X ray, ECG, and uh, at the end confirmed uh, uh, with CTPE. So I can uh, hear uh, the upper part is the uh, ECG on admission, and the later one uh, after uh, almost a week. And the reason I'm, I'm doing putting that comparison because this patient, uh, while we're treating her, we elected really to give her low dose. Uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy, and I, I will mention why. So you can see uh, the patient had uh, uh, key inversion in the inferior and interior lead, 
which can uh, tell us there is uh, some strain on the right ventricle. Uh, her X-ray on admission on the left and uh, after this, uh, before discharge on the right, you can see prominent congested both pulmonary hyla. And uh, basically this patient, uh, as I said, uh, there was high suspicion. So of course we did CTPE and you can see uh, significant uh, uh, like multiple uh, filling defects, uh, mostly on the right side in the main pulmonary artery with extension to upper and lower segmental branches. Also, you can see on the left side, she has a segmental uh, uh, defect, uh, mostly in the, in the lingula and left lower uh, branches. So you can see that this patient really showering uh, uh, or like she had multiple uh, uh, defect. Or, or, so it's really significant. Uh, a couple of days you know, after uh, this uh, admission, we did the venous Doppler uh, just to see, you know, if there is any DVT or not, and uh, we we found that there was no DVT at that time. Uh, uh, so, uh, as recommended by most of the uh, guidelines now, uh, anytime we deal with PE, we have to do the PE severity index, uh, which will help us to uh, classify the patient from mortality uh, wise, and also it help us in the management if we have a level. Uh, very low level, uh, sometimes uh, if the patient uh, can be discharged and treated as home or early discharge. And of course, if it's like unstable, we go for uh, thrombolytic therapy. And in between, we make a decision on what's the best treatment for the patient. So this patient, uh, she's 47 as age. We add 30 to her uh, uh, blood pressure because her blood pressure uh, never uh, went down less than 90, but it was almost uh, between 90 and 100 more on the lower side, uh, 90, 95. And also she had some uh, uh, hypoxia uh, initially in the uh, uh, admission, uh, less than 90. So uh, she comes enter uh, level uh, three, which is enter uh, median. And uh, as you see here with the European Society of Cardiology uh, 2019, there was some change in the management as, uh, as we see, like we decide stable and stable, then we do the uh, 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 severity scoring. Uh, and uh, in the green, you can see the low. Uh, it used to be at that time, if everything is negative, uh, to have an option if we need to do uh, echo or to do uh, uh, biomarkers like troponin, BMP. But nowadays, since, 19, uh, since 2019, the decision is changed where even with low score, we should look for a right ventricle uh, dysfunction, either from the echo or the sometimes the CTPA uh, can show that, or, or uh, biological by checking troponin and uh, BMB. So this patient, uh, uh, her echo, uh, the lower part, uh, the one with the red table, this is her initial echo and uh, you can see uh, it showed uh, paradoxical septal motion uh, consistent with right ventricle volume overload, uh, moderate dilated right atrium, right ventricle with uh, uh, might reduce right ventricular systolic, uh, systolic function. Her uh, pulmonary artery uh, blood pressure was high, 62. Uh, so that was really significant. Although her blood pressure didn't go less than 90, but this is a significant uh, right ventricle dysfunction. Uh, and uh, uh, based on her uh, low, sorry, based uh, uh, on her age, young, with low risk of bleeding, she's healthy, uh, and with what we see on the echo with her uh, BNB elevation and so on, we talk to the patient and we give her the option of giving low dose uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy, and the patient agreed and we did that. And we can see her echo before discharge about five, seven days after. Uh, uh, you can see the pulmonary blood pressure went down from 62 to uh, uh, 29, which is really significant. And hopefully that will help her down the road uh, to avoid uh, complication. Uh, so you can see her BNB before we gave her the uh, uh, low dose TPA and later on anticoagulation uh, and her D-dimer uh, dropped uh, well. Uh, uh, this is not the topic of this uh, uh, presentation, but I would like really everybody to uh, 
uh, read uh, the MOBIT trial, which is uh, regarding the low dose uh, or what we call half dose uh, TPA uh, for selected patient. I think it's beneficial. It showed decrease in the pulmonary blood pressure and uh, uh, composite endpoint uh, from 57% without it to 16% with significant p-value. Uh, and also, uh, when we looked at uh, secondary points, uh, it was also uh, significant, uh, with really not uh, uh, increase in major bleed. Actually, in this study, uh, it, uh, nobody had any bleeding. Uh, so uh, this is something to consider for some patient, selected patient. Uh, so, uh, so after we treated her with uh, uh, enoxaparin for a few days and she's doing better, we, now she's ready for discharge. So I know there is no interaction uh, with a, a virtual meeting, uh, but uh, just like uh, usually we need to ask ourselves when we discharge this patient, which anticoagulation uh, we should send her on. And uh, Basically, we have the option of multiple NUACs. We have the option of warfarin. Uh, uh, but uh, as you will see down the road in the slides, basically NUAC is the preferred uh, uh, anticoagulation uh, from all the guidelines if the patient can afford it and there is no other uh, contraindication. Uh, so, so this patient will be sent on anticoagulation. So this is now where related to our topics. Uh, how long uh, uh, would you keep her on anticoagulation? Uh, so the option is three months because people they think it's provoked by uh, contraceptive, six months, or for life if no contraindication. So just give you a think about it and uh, let's see uh, what, what you will do for this patient. So if you decide that this patient really uh, needs to be uh, on extended anticoagulation for life with no contraindication, what dose of NUAC will you use uh, 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 if you decide to do extension? Uh, so this patient, uh, basically, she was treated initially with enoxaparin when she's ready for home or a couple of days before she went home. We started her on rivaroxaban, the loading dose. 15 milligram PID for, to continue 21 day. Then uh, we talked to the patient about her uh, benefit and risk. And uh, uh, we talked about that, although she had uh, uh, minor uh, provoking uh, uh, factors, with, which is contraceptive. Uh, uh, and we talked about you know, all the guidelines, what we're, I'm gonna present. And the patient uh, really decided to uh, agree to go with uh, extension of anticoagulation for life unless there is contraindication. Uh, so, so why should we really consider uh, anticoagulation, extension of anticoagulation uh, if it's appropriate? So we know that VTE, uh, especially in the part of the PE, is a, is a very serious and fatal uh, disease. You can see about 3 million deaths per, per year worldwide uh, because of VTE which is in some cases uh, actually more than oncology deaths, uh, multiple uh, uh, oncology like breast, prostate cancer and so on. Uh, so, uh, so any patient who has DVT, it can migrate and cause PE, which can be fatal as we already mentioned, but if it's not fatal, uh, there is really very significant comorbidity. Uh, so DVT with time can cause uh, uh, post thrombosis syndrome uh, with, which is very uh, uh, troublesome for our patient. Also, if the PE does, doesn't kill the patient, uh, the patient might develop CTIF, which is very uh, also reduced quality of life. So, and as you will see in the next few slides, any patient who develop uh, DVT, he's at risk of recurrent DVT. And if the patient has one or more DVTs, then again, uh, the risk of fatal PE, the risk of the other comorbidity uh, increase. So usually when we, we, we try to really do our best to reduce this recurrent or um, eliminate this recurrent uh, to, to help our patients. So our job as a physician is to protect our patient by preventing the recurrence of VTE by using the most appropriate anticoagulation and appropriate dose uh, according to uh, the guidelines and the uh, experience. Uh, uh, you saw this slide before, but this is where I'm, I'm showing it again. 
because in level four and five uh, on the pulmonary embolism severity index, you can see the mortality, 30 day mortality can go up to 10% and in the very high score up to 25%. So it's a fatal and serious uh, disease if we don't uh, take care of it. And for post-thrombotic syndrome, uh, I had a few patients uh, with this, and I can tell you this is really the worst, one of the worst chronic disease uh, the patient can have. It, it really affects the quality of the care, and you can see it can happen in one third of the patient within five years. Of course, if the patient has recurrent DVT, it will make it even uh, higher incidence. And you can see it will cause pain, edema, and down the road venous ulceration, and it's really very, very uh, troublesome for uh, our patient. And for CTIF also, it's very uh, serious uh, disease. It, it's a progressive in nature. Mortality can go up to 20%. And uh, 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 it can actually, initially, the patient might not have a symptomatic uh, uh, VTE or PE, and while, while we're working up the patient for pulmonary hypertension, when we do VQ scan, we find that the patient had VTE before once or more. And uh, always we need to keep this in mind and ask the patient about those symptoms on the slide uh, to, to decide uh, uh, whenever we need to do workup to, to rule out CTIF. And you can see on the right side, some of the risk factors like younger age, larger perfusion defect, and of course, uh, idiopathic PE. But it can happen with any kind of PE. Uh, uh. This slide, uh, you know, we have really multiple NUAC on the uh, market, and all of them are really good one, and you can choose whatever you want. But I usually try uh, in my practice to, to try to see if there is one can give me a little bit benefit from the other. And uh, with river Exavan, I, I really see that, you know, it's the only NUAC which really looked at uh, early clot regression uh, following acute PE. So in the study, they, they did uh, uh, initial CT or VQ scan, and they uh, follow after 21 days, they repeated to see the regression of the uh, clot. And you can see in this slide, 88% uh, of the patient had either partial uh, clot resolution or complete clot resolution, 41% for complete and 47 for uh, partial. And you can see no change in 12% and zero worsening. Uh, the, so I know in the field of anticoagulation, uh, there is a lot of research needs to be done. And I, I found that this is something really needs to be looked at if, if uh, if NUAC and Rivaraxaban, since it showed the study, it showed regression uh, or complete resolution, does this uh, really change down the, uh, down the road the CTIF incidence, uh, uh, the pulmonary hypertension, uh, and so on? But for me, this is something uh, can uh, I have it in mind when uh, sometimes choose between NUAC. Uh, so let's go through a few slides about uh, uh, risk factor. So we know that uh, the virtue triad is, uh, 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 describes the three primary uh, mechanism for the develop clotting and VTE, endothelial energy, uh, uh, injury, circulation status, hypercoagulable state. And on each side, you can see multiple uh, disease or conditions which can affect uh, either one or more than one of those, uh, those mechanisms. Uh, and here we can see, uh, you know, while we're treating uh, P VTE in the last few years, we were always uh, talking about provoked and unprovoked VTE. Uh, and uh, always like, I, I can remember myself, uh, you know, since residency and early uh, practice, uh, we, we usually, we didn't really differentiate too much between when we say provoke, then usually we say it's three months and that's more than enough. But nowadays we have more data, we have a new medication, we have more data about the extension of anticoagulation uh, uh, and the risk and benefit where uh, nowadays many bodies are really trying to avoid, uh, if possible, uh, talking about provoke and provoke because sometimes we might miss, uh, uh, we, we might not give some of the patient with provoked VT the benefit of extension of anticoagulation. And I will uh, elaborate on this in the uh, next few slides. 
So you can see here on the right, uh, provo uh, unprovoked, which is you know most likely patient are uh, are comfortable uh, giving extension of anticoagulation. The middle one, which is continuing uh, reversible factors like cancer, uh, hypercoagulable, uh, antiphospho uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, and so on. Again, many of the uh, physician feel comfortable uh, extending the uh, uh, anticoagulation. But now the emphasis in the last few years is more on the left side uh, re regarding uh, when it's provoked. And nowadays, really, we need to differentiate between major uh, provoked factors or minor, because that might uh, affect our management and decision for long term. It was also very clear and very nice uh, in the ESC 2019, where they put this nice uh, table to tell us about three category regarding the long term uh, uh, recurrence. So you can see on the uh, left side, here, uh, this is one of the category, uh, uh, which is 3% uh, per year uh, recurrence uh, rate. And this is considered major transient or reversible factors, uh, like a major surgery, uh, admission more than three days uh, to the hospital with acute uh, uh, medical illness, trauma with fractures. Uh, so this, this group, uh, the recurrence is uh, higher than because anybody who has BTE can have another one, but the, uh, the recurrence uh, on a yearly basis uh, less than 3%. So this is uh, uh, a group where nowadays uh, uh, three months anticoagulation is uh, more than enough. Uh, but here, you know, they talked about the intermediate uh, uh, group, which is about three to 8% per year recurrence. And uh, it comes under a transient or reversible factors. So you can see our patient, uh, it comes in this category, which is uh, estrogen therapy or contraception. And of course you have other uh, minor uh, or reversal factors uh, in the, this group. And this is the group now we, we really need to uh, think carefully and, and uh, talk to the patient uh, regarding uh, three months or extension according to the profile of the patient. Uh, and again, in this category, you can see non-malignant persistent risk factor and or uh, uh, no identifiable risk factor. And the last group, which is uh, recurrence more than 8% per year, it's high. Those the patient with active cancer, with antiphospholipid uh, syndrome and other significant uh, uh, thrombophilia and patient who had really uh, more than one uh, uh, DVT or one without major uh, uh, factors. Uh, so so uh, I in the next few slides, I will also uh, try to give you a few study uh, and give you a few characteristics of the VTE uh, or the patient, uh, which you should really consider when you decide about anticoagulation extension or not to extend. Uh, so in this slide, we can see uh, the recurrence uh, after uh, acute BTE or PE uh, uh, in weeks up to three months. Uh, we, all of us, we know that the risk uh, is the highest in the three uh, months after uh, acute uh, BTE. And definitely the, fourth week, uh, the four, first four weeks are the most crucial one. And this is where sometimes we get can, consultation uh, if the patient needs surgery, can we interrupt the anticoagulation and so on? So usually in this period, we, uh, unless it's emergency, we really always uh, uh, tell the uh, referring physician to uh, postpone if, uh, if it's not uh, emergency. And this is also where I can see some benefit of the uh, new NUACs uh, like Reverexaban uh, uh, in the first four weeks, because when we give the loading dose up to three weeks, uh, we're really covering uh, this area without the fluctuation in the uh, warfarin levels because this is the highest risk for recurrence. Uh, of course, you can use uh, abexaban if you need. We, we can give the loading dose 10 milligram BID for one week, but I see here really three weeks uh, give me a little bit more uh, confidence that the patient is getting uh, uh, appropriate and no fluctuation uh, uh, anticoagulation. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the case of rivaroxaban and abexaban, uh, you can see that 
uh, usually the anti-factor 10 activity is similar uh, to enoxaprine. That's the reason sometimes if the patient does not need admission or we can discharge the patient early, uh, we really don't need to uh, uh, overlap it with uh, enoxaprine or low molecular uh, weight heparin. Uh, uh, but the other one like the bigotran and edoxaban, usually we really need to uh, over uh, do it for one week. Also because the study of those uh, two anticoagulation was with uh, overlapping uh, with low molecular heparin for one week. So, and here looking at the uh, recurrence after uh, stopping the treatment, uh, uh, when we look at proximal DVT and or PE, we can see the minute we stop the anticoagulation, uh, every year uh, we have 10% increase in the uh, recurrence of uh, VTE. And we know that up to 10%, it could be fatal. Uh, so again, I will throw this question, just like if you can uh, think about it, uh, we don't have the interactive session. Uh, uh, according to your opinion and experience, uh, who has the highest risk of recurrence? And, and we're talking about recurrence, not the first DBT uh, or PE. So if patient less than 30 or more than 60 or male or female, so in this slide, it will address the uh, age issue for recurrence uh, after stopping the anticoagulation. You can see that the male uh, uh, patient is at higher risk of uh, recurrence uh, for both DVT and PE, but more uh, prominent for the DVT. Uh, and in this slide, you can see the difference between uh, main, male and female. You can see male is uh, at higher risk of recurrence. Uh, uh, it's about threefold uh, more than the uh, female patients. So again, those uh, things needs to be uh, 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 thought about when we decide about extension or not extension. Uh, again, looking at the DVT and location of thrombus, uh, if we know that proximal DV DVT is much more serious than distal, it's, it has more chance to migrate for PE uh, but also for recurrence is really one of the most common risk factor associated with VTE recurrence. So when we deal with a patient who has a proximal DVT, I think we really need to differentiate this and, and keep it in our calculation. Uh, so and uh, here, if you can see where the uh, red arrow, uh, patients presenting with PE are three more likely to suffer recurrent PE than those presenting with DVT. We know some patient, you know, they come with PE, we don't do Doppler, so we don't know if they have DVT, PE, whatever, but patient who comes with PE and our patient uh, go with that because we did Doppler and it was negative at the time we did the Doppler. Uh, so she's at higher risk to come back again with significant PE. And you can see in this slide, as we said, unprovoked has really the highest recurrence uh, uh, of VTE. But again, uh, we're emphasizing on this uh, group where non-surgical trigger or transient uh, minor uh, trigger, uh, they are also at higher risk of uh, uh, recurrent DVT. And this is where uh, we really need to put more emphasis uh, on this group. Uh, so again, this is a list of the things when, when we decide to, to, after we finish the initial uh, require anticoagulation, and we need to decide about anticoagulation. So idiopathic or like unprovoked, high risk thrombophilia like uh, antiphospholipid and other significant thrombophilia. If the patient has proximal DVT, if the patient presented with PE uh, initially without DVT, if the patient has cancer, male gender, as we say, and younger uh, population. And also there are many studies to show that residual thrombus mass can affect uh, the recurrence. And again, this is where I can see maybe river rexaban because they proven to, to see clot regression or complete resolution at the end of the management where it might uh, show some difference. And again, this is from the pooled uh, analysis uh, for, from the uh, study, but this is including both DVT and PE when they looked at regression, you can see in the pink uh, color uh, Revacorexaban had more uh, complete resolution of thrombus uh, uh, comparing with the standard of care, which is uh, uh, enoxaprine VKA. 
Uh, we also know that uh, D-dimer is very important. So when we, uh, you know, many patients sometimes after stopping anticoagulation, uh, they wait a few weeks, they repeat D-dimer, and if the D-dimer uh, is high, that puts the patient again at higher risk of recurring. But the problem with this, uh, that, you know, sometimes we have to stop the anticoagulation and wait for a few, uh, few weeks. So the patient might really have another VTE in that area. So, but this is also to, to, to keep in mind that it can help sometimes. Uh, also, we have multiple clinical scores to predict uh, recurrence. Uh, and this is unfortunately only for unprovoked VTE. It doesn't really cover provoked. And you can see we have uh, three main uh, scores. Uh, on the left side, uh, uh, you, uh, this is for uh, female only. And the, uh, the Vienna prediction model and the DASH score can be used for both. And uh, you can see it looks at gender, looks at the location, looks at the D-dimer after, after anticoagulation, uh, and look at the age. Uh, so as we already mentioned in the last few slides, those are the things really we need to put it together. So if any doubt really uh, in our decision, we can always uh, uh, do this. Uh, but nowadays it's sometimes really uh, not needed because uh, it's very obvious. Uh, so having said, you know, what we talked about the risk and the benefit. So really a uh, couple of uh, three things really we need to talk about. Uh, how can we protect our VTE patient? Why not prolonging the treatment? And uh, is this reflected in the most recent guidelines? So if we look at the uh, uh, 2016 ACCP, uh, you can see it's a busy slide. I will summarize it in three points, basically. NOAC is preferred uh, uh, over warfarin unless the patient cannot afford it or there is a contraindication or the patient has uh, antiphospholipid, especially if they have the three uh, titer positive, antibody uh, positive. And uh, uh, the second one, you usually, if it's major surgery, uh, usually we go three months. But if it's not really major surgery, we have the option of extension. And as we need to decide about the uh, bleeding risk in our decision. So even uh, if the patient has higher bleeding risk, then we might stop at three months at, at any time. Uh, or if there is a bleeding risk low to moderate, then we have the option for extension. And again, we have to weigh the benefit and risk. Uh, so again, it's also reflected in the uh, European Society of Cardiology 2019, where, as we said, major transient provoked like surgery, uh, trauma, major surgery, major admission, then you know we can stop at three months. But anything other than that, starting from minor transient provoke uh, factors, or and provoke or persistent provoke, uh, we can consider extension uh, of anticoagulation. So, uh, so for I mean, we can address VTE really in multiple practical uh, approaches. But today we're concentrating on the duration of anticoagulation. Uh, uh, so again, I will throw this uh, clinical scenario. And while I'm I'm reading the study, uh, the question, I would like you to really uh, highlight some of the uh, 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 things we talked about makes the patient at higher recurrence. So it will help us uh, to decide about what should we do for this patient. So 44 year old healthy man is evaluated in follow up for an episode of unprovoked left proximal leg deep venous thrombosis three months ago, following initial anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin, he began treatment with warfarin INR test done every three to four weeks. He's shown a stable therapeutic INR and he is compliant with it. He has mild left uh, uh, leg discomfort slash edema after long day of standing, but it doesn't limit his activity. Uh, he tolerated warfarin well. Family history is unremarkable. He, and he takes no other medication. Uh, so the question is, which of the following is the most appropriate management? Uh, he, he had a proximal DBT. He had the treatment now with warfarin for three months. And now uh, you're deciding, should we continue after three months or not? So A is continue anticoagulation indefinitely. 
be discontinue war for an, an unza, uh, so give him three more months then stop c discontinue war for him now and d discontinue war for him and perform thrombophilia testing if it's not done uh, initially so uh, i hope you 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 had few uh, you highlighted a few things i will say in uh, so in my errors so this guy is a young as we already talked about he's male he is unprovoked uh, uh, DVT, it's proximal. And, you know, the patient is showing some uh, early sign of possible PTS, uh, post-thrombotic uh, syndrome. And, you know, uh, he takes no other medication. So there is no drug-drug interaction and there is no dual antiplatelet or other antiplatelet. And by looking at this scenario, we as, you know, uh, the healthy other than that, most likely also his bleeding risk is low. So, so in, in this, and for bleeding, usually we don't really use a has blood uh, score, which is used for atrial fibrillation uh, because it's not validated for BTE. We usually look at those risk factor and decide if the uh, no risk factor, low risk, moderate one risk factor, more than two uh, risk factor. Uh, so that will be part of our decision. So in this patient, you can see proximal DVT or PE unprovoked, uh, low to moderate bleeding risk, then extension of the treatment. So, so hopefully you answer this question as continue anticoagulation indefinitely. Uh, so again, you know, in that scenario, the patient is going to continue with anticoagulation. He already got three months of warfarin. So would you offer him different anticoagulation and what dose? So, you know, you have the option to continue warfarin, uh, but, you know, uh, we know the advantage of NOAC. We know it's the preferred one. So definitely in this patient, I will talk to him. Uh, if no concern about cost, if there is no other contraindication for NOAC, I would definitely consider him uh, uh, as a good candidate for long-term uh, anticoagulation with NOAC. Uh, I mean, I usually have very good success with Rivaroxaban. It's my drug of choice since it came to the market uh, uh, and I'm familiar with it and it's a once a day. So usually I will offer him this, uh, but you can, we can also offer him a Bixaban if, if you need whatever. But as we said, I, I usually try to differentiate one from the other for compliance, for uh, cost, for whatever. So this patient definitely, well, I will consider switching him to NOAC, regardless of which we use. But you know, uh, after we finish three more months, six months, we uh, nowadays we have the uh, data to support us to reduce the dose instead from 20 milligram daily to 10 milligram daily indefinitely, unless there is contraindication. Or if you decide to go with a Bexiban, you can go with a low dose 2.5 uh, uh, BID. Again, it's like one is once a day, the other is BID. Uh, and you can see here in the uh, European Society of Cardiology, uh, uh, also they recommend after finishing six months of treatment uh, to, to consider uh, reducing the dose uh, of reverexaban to 10 milligram uh, if, if it's not related to cancer. Because if it's cancer or a significant hyper uh, coagulable uh, issue, uh, then usually we don't recommend to reduce the dose because they are very, very high risk. Uh, uh, and of course, for antiphospholipid, uh, as we'll see in the next few slides, is recommended to keep warfarin instead of the uh, NOAC. Although some experts, they say if it's a triple uh, antibody, then definitely no, no for NOAC. But many patients, if there is issue with warfarin, whatever, you can consider NOAC but with a closed monitoring, but we don't recommend definitely to reduce 20 to 10 milligram. We keep going with a, a 20 milligram. So what is the evidence for extension? Uh, many study, a uh, couple of study from, uh, 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 from Rivarexaban, and there is study from Abixaban uh, talking about the extension and so on. So today I will mention the one from uh, Einstein extension with, uh, you know, patient after they finish six to 12 months uh, of treatment for BTE, uh, the decision now to stop completely or to uh, extend. So they randomize the patient into uh, two group placebo without anticoagulation and 
uh, rivaroxaban 20 milligram, and they looked at efficacy recurrent VTE and uh, fatal uh, PE and so on, and also looking at safety measure bleeding. So you can see here, uh, definitely when we extended uh, with rivaroxaban 20 milligram, we had 82% uh, relative risk reduction uh, for uh, as an efficacy. Uh, and also uh, for major bleeding, there was no statistical different, uh, difference, but we know that uh, the patient had a little bit more bleeding uh, where they required uh, blood transfusion. Uh, it was mostly GI and menorrhagia, but there was no fatal bleeding and there was no uh, critical site bleeding. Uh, and you can see the net benefit really uh, was uh, looking at the benefit and the uh, 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 bleeding, major bleeding, the benefit outweighs uh, uh, placebo. So I, I see that Dr. Abdullah is uh, trying to rush me a little bit, so I will go with quickly. It will take two minutes. So again, another study, uh, the uh, Einstein choice, uh, basically after finishing six to 12 months, uh, again, the decision was to extend or not, but in this study, they looked at rivaroxaban 20 milligram Rivaroxaban 10 milligram and aspirin 100 milligram. So Rivaroxaban 20, we know we saw the extension which showed benefit, a net clinical benefit also. Rivaroxaban 10 milligram, it showed benefit in post orthopedic uh, prophylaxis. And aspirin in previous study showed 30% uh, less recurrence of BTE with no increase in measure. So this is a, a rational out of this study. And you can see definitely 10 and 20 did really uh, reduce the recurrence comparing with aspirin. This is on the top of the 30% reduction in aspirin. Uh, and it was uh, also for major bleeding, it was not more than uh, aspirin. Uh, and in the 10 milligrams, there, the number was, was a little bit less than the 20, but it was not statistically significant. And uh, also the nicest things about Einstein choice and extension, they did sub analysis regarding uh, provoked or non-provoked. And you can see that the patient with unprovoked or provoked, regardless if it's minor or transient or persistent, uh, it showed benefit for those patients. Uh, and I will, again, this is NOAC is a preferred one. And we already covered this uh, where we really even in the 2019 ESC, ESC, they recommend to extend for a patient with uh, unprovoked, with persistent uh, 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 risk factor or uh, minor uh, triggers. Uh, and last uh, point, uh, we really need to follow those patients after uh, uh, VT, especially PE and look for any signs and symptoms for CTF and, uh, and have a good follow-up initially and later on, and always keep in mind uh, to diagnose CTF because it's, uh, uh, we can really do something about it. So in summary, basically minimum effective duration of therapy is three months. NUAC is the preferred one, unless there is contraindication or cost issue. Uh, and provoke persistent risk factor, minor uh, reversible transient factors, all we should consider anticoagulation after talking to our patient and let them decide with us. And uh, uh, if any doubt, uh, we can always use D-dimer after stopping anticoagulation and look at some clinical risk uh, scores. And sorry for the uh, extra time. So. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Salah, can you come? on with us so we can tackle the question. We have, we have, we have 281 attendees and uh, we have a few complex questions. I think I'd like you, we only have 20 minutes for discussion. So I'd like the answer to be brief and to the point please. So one of the questions I think is uh, every time we've been asked is people like to ask about, you know, something minor, you know, majority patients are not into stage renal failure or dialysis, but they're still asking. So uh, there's no, they say there's no evidence, you know, which one to choose, warfarin or NOAX, but why not to go with warfarin? They think because they we, at least be able to monitor it uh, compared to rivaxaban or apaxaban. What's your answer, Dr. Yeah. Uh, for for end-stage renal disease and hemodialysis patient, still, as I mentioned in my presentation, is still a point of controversies about the NOAX. 
However, the only one now for still has the evidence that can be used is warfarin. But we have a retrospective data, as I showed, promising data comes from Abixaban and Rivaroxaban. I think in the nearby future, maybe this will be changed. But for the time being, question with indecisional disease and the hemodialysis, and do you want to use? It's better to use the warfarin. However, as I said, still we have some coming retrospective data, promising data. You can try to use it, but still with no uh, evidence. Any any experience yourself, Dr. Mohammed, using it in uh, uh, for dialysis patient? I by myself, I don't have too much experience, but at least I'm trying to cooperate with my nephrologist in our center, and uh, I tried. I would tested some patient by uh, Rivaroxaban. Right. So, so I think they are, they are doing well for the time being while I'm following them up and they are doing well for this one. But anyway, in general, as I said, and I heard this from one of the American College of Cardiology board of, in, uh, uh, for detecting the guideline. He said, what we have in America now for the time being, uh, we can use the warfarin However, still Zanuak, still we are waiting more and the more evident data. But in other things, you can try by yourself, your personal experience. Right. So Dr. Mohammed Tarakh, a question about um, pulmonary embolism and DVT. Um, you know, before you, before you, an expert see a patient, sometimes these patients started already on low molecular weight heparin. So how do you take that, you know, risk of bleeding if you start, I mean, how you, how you manage your patient starting on Novax? Somebody already started on low molecular weight heparin. You mean as acute or yeah, most likely during the hospital? Uh, yeah, most yeah. likely. Yes. Yeah. So again, uh, you know, we evaluate if it's really PE or DVT. Uh, and uh, definitely for PE, we do the score. And as we said, if it's low score and no other really uh, um, uh, issues, we can always uh, shift the patient from enoxaparin to low molecular, and we can discharge the patient uh, early. And the switch is really very easy because as, as I showed, it really worked as fast as the enoxaparin. So usually we just uh, uh, stop, you know, if, uh, when the patient is due for the next enoxaparin or uh, low molecular heparin, we don't give it. And we give the uh, in, uh, first dose of, uh, you know, the NOAC, uh, usually, as we said, it's going to be uh, either rivaroxaban or abixaban within two hours uh, period, you know, so because it's usually start. Uh, so I usually give it at the same time of the next dose of enoxaparin. So, Mohammed, uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Salah, the patients yes. who come to with acute coronary syndrome and the stage renal failure or, you know, patient who's going for uh, elective, um, you know, stenting and uh, end stage renal failure and atrial fibrillation and patient already on aspirin and plavix how you manage this patient from anticoagulation point of view so is if already the patient on aspirin and plavix it depends on how long this intervention habit okay and usually now the recommendation for atrial fibrillation patient with an acute coronary syndrome that you can use treble anticoagulation anti anticoagulation and the whack and then for a short period, you can stop aspirin and you deal with either Plavix plus the direct oral anticoagulant. And then after uh, six months to one year, then you can use only the direct oral anticoagulant. So, but this is if the patient has acute coronary syndrome, but if the patient has not acute coronary syndrome, there is no, no, uh, no, no value of to use aspirin and the Plavix for this patient. It will not protect him against the stroke. Okay, even even if you put patient on um, if patient require a stent. No, no, no. I speak about. I'm not speak about a stent. Patient ischemic heart disease already, as I mentioned, acute coronary syndrome, stent, whatever. We should give him the treble anticoagulation. Now the aspirin, they said it can be given for one week, and then you have dual uh, anti platelets and then anticoagulant. Then after that, after one year or six months after one year, you can use the direct oral anticoagulant. Mohammed Tarak, the patients who are coming with the pulmonary embolism, um, you know, and regarding this question, but regarding the continu continuation of anticoagulation after PE, is it important to screen 
the patient for thrombophilia? So basically, uh, as we say, you know, if you notice uh, nowadays, really, it might not make a big difference if we do it or not, uh, because as we say, if it's a male, uh, young, uh, you know, uh, PE and so on, uh, the, all the guidelines tell us to really extend. Uh, it doesn't hurt to do it uh, for like our knowledge, whatever. The only difference will be if the patient has antiphospholipid syndrome, and this is why now, you know, uh, uh, I might screen, screen for that because that might differ, uh, 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 that uh, on that we might change from NOAC to warfarin. Uh, so that's the only one really might change our uh, If the patient uh, or the physician doesn't feel comfortable going with the extension without this, then I will do it. And that sometimes might convince the physician or the patient if there is significant hypercoagulable, they feel more comfortable to extend. Uh, but in reality, as we already mentioned or discussed in the, you know, uh, it might not change our management. Uh, we might go with the extension regardless. Okay, uh, so again, the question for both of you, you know, this is a, another territory which is, we have, you know, we are learning is uh, the patient with cancer and having DVT or having atrial fibrillation, uh, both of you from atrial fibrillation point of view and from DVTP point of view, how you manage? For patient of cancer with atrial fibrillation, I think it was a statement, it was mentioned clearly in the guidelines that you can use uh, the rivaroxaban. It's mentioned by name for the patient with cancer. Provided that there is the type of cancer is not associated with a high incidence of bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding, especially, uh, or high incidence of bleeding, like the, uh, I think the carcinoma of intestine or something like that. But in the guideline recently, uh, they use they mention rivaroxaban by name to be used in atrial fibrillation with cancer. I mean, from VTE, I agree. Uh, basically, nowadays we're using more NOAC than before. Uh, the only, I think there is four steps to decide. Usually, we need to look at what cancer, if any uh, active GI cancer or urinary genital cancer, we might need to be careful. It's not contraindication, but we have to tell the patient there is a little bit more risk. Uh, but, and also sometimes we have to look at the drug-drug interaction uh, and talk to the patient and see what the preference, because we know for DVTPE after cancer, most likely it's gonna be extension for life. So the patient might really take the enoxaprine for a month or two, then suddenly they stop without telling the physician. So it's really more dangerous. So nowadays really the only really uh, uh, things we have to be careful, uh, active GI or urinary symptoms, otherwise we're using it more and more. So again, question to you, Dr. Mohammed Tarak, is just one of the, you know, that in this is wondering why reason to make recurrent VTE in male more than female? Any, any reason for any mechanism? Um, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's well known. It's just like, you know, when they did this observational uh, observation study, which is really large amount, they found that it's much more. So to be honest, I, I don't know really the reason. Uh, and I'm not sure if anybody really know, uh, it will be yeah. nice to it. I think that's I think that's that's great because that's the answer. We really we don't know. That's no, no. Uh, normally, this this kind of is looking at the efficacy rather than mechanism. So another question is about you know we are we are living in a in a COVID. We should not forget this. You know, and the people say, where what's the role of NOAX in in, in COVID patient who coming either um, you know having atrial fibrillation and then having uh, you know acute coronary syndrome or DVT. So from, yes. yes. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Mahmoud. Okay, from VTE point, uh, you know, if the patient already has VTE and already on NUAC, uh, when they come to the hospital, really most of the recommendation is to, to change to heparin, either low molecular or uh, unfractionated, depending on why, why you know, if there is any contraindication for one or easier for one, whatever. Uh, then when they go home, we, we switch them back just because of the drug-drug interaction with anti-COVID treatment. Uh, and also what we what found is uh, 
uh, heparin, uh, low molecular or unfractionated. Uh, it has also anti-inflammatory. It has uh, other feature which help in the uh, cytokine, cytokine syndrome uh, during COVID. So usually we prefer during the hospitalization in the acute to go with heparin. Then when the patient go home, we switch back to Newark. It is the same for me for the patient of COVID with atrial fibrillation. During hospitalization, always we can we give the, the low molecular weight heparin because the fear of drug drug interaction with uh, uh, NOAC. However, after the patient is stabilized, charge home, then we can uh, start him on NOAC. It will not be hard. But the problem is that, that some people now they start NOAC directly while the patient in the uh, hospital. This is not uh, recommended at all uh, for the COVID patient uh, during hospitalization. Yeah, in addition to that, what you, both of you experts say, you know, I think because of actually both of them, low molecular heparin and uh, NOAX, we have no data, really strong data in, in COVID. We're just using it from our uh, previous, um, you know, um, just giving reference to what we had in the past. But because is, this is, you know, injection, that one is oral, and they people think because the absorption get, you know, disturbed, with the COVID. I think that's one of maybe the reasons. Um, so the question is about, um, you know, since this is a buyer meeting uh, supporting this event, what's the, you know, what's, you know, we have like four NOACs now available. There's no head to head uh, comparison. But what gives the edge for uh, Rubarsuban over other um, NOACs to be used for primary embryo, DVT, and atrophibulation? The scenarios which uh, we discussed tonight, uh, both of you. So from the point of atrial fibrillation, I think the best scenario is that we saw this is the case that I, I have it today. Usually the NOAC, they are a, as a very beneficial group of drugs, of course, and they show they are as effective and even superior to warfarin. But the most important thing, when you choose the NOAC, you have to choose or you make risk stratification of your patient and you have to choose the right patient. Always I have a belief there is a right NOAC for a right patient and a right dose. So if you have, if you have a high risk patient, as, as I showed and uh, studied in the real world evidence and uh, uh, in randomized phase three trial, uh, like in the rocket FF, which is contains most of the patient in the rocket FM was very high risk patient. They have, they have the hypertension, diabetes, TIA, and, and, and even all the age. Uh, the, the most of the patient, all the age in rocket FM was more than 80 or 85 years, which is the kind of age that we are seeing uh, even in the Northern Emirate region. Sometimes we are seeing 100. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, the easiest answer. Usually look for the protoplasm of your patient and then decide what kind of NOAC you will choose. For a very high risk patient like that, and he has multiple comorbid condition, then uh, the preferable uh, NOAC to be used is the uh, rivaroxaban. So uh, this is, that is, that's again, that I, I'm not saying that you have to use even rivaroxaban every patient, but there is a kind of patients that you have to use it. And fortunately enough, in the Northern Emirate region, this kind of patient is the majority of the patient we have usually very old age, multiple comorbid condition, renal impairment. And we have a very good experience now uh, with uh, uh, rivaroxaban in this kind of patient. This from, from, my, of, from my point of view from atrial fibrillation. Okay, for VTE, basically, you know, all of them can work very well. Uh, for me, and usually I discuss, discuss this with the patient always, Rivaroxaban for me once a day versus, you know, abixaban twice a day. Uh, because nowadays, really, those are uh, the, the, the one used the most. Uh, although eduxaban, I think it's coming to the UAE very soon. Uh, uh, it's a once a day. Uh, so, so for me, once a day, it has an uh, edge on it. As I mentioned during my presentation with Rivaroxaban, it's the only NOAC which showed really clot regression or complete resolution. It can be a differentiating point. Uh, 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 Rivaroxaban for P VTE, you know, the study, they have multiple studies. They have the population of their study really much more than the other one. So, and, and we've been using it for a long time. So this is really also count. And they have a lot of word uh, 
uh, real world uh, uh, study. So that's really uh, also cost wise, you know, a little bit less than abixaban. Uh, uh, although down the road, maybe a doxepan for some such patient who cannot afford, it might be a choice. For cancer, uh, if you look at the NCCN guidelines, they put a doxepan because of the drug-drug interaction as level A, although can be used, a rivaroxaban or a doxepan. So again, each patient, I think we have to sit with the patient, give him all the information, although we have a preference, but sometimes the patient might have a preference. Dr. Abdallah, if you can allow me, I would like also to emphasize on this point that also the one of the advantage is a single dose because this gives you the adherence will become more reliable for your patient. And of course, I have always uh, asked the patient about his uh, uh, preference. Uh, but you know, as you know, in our field, there's a cardiovascular patient, cardi cardiac patient, they have a very polypharmacy with him. So it's better to use uh, one drug. Another important thing, Dr. Abdallah, that recently in this uh, ACC guideline that uh, mentions, he mentioned a very important statement that he said bleeding risk reduction with NOAC was similar in diabetic and non-diabetic patients, except for the abixaban where a lower reduction in hemorrhagic complication was reported in atrial fibrillation patient with diabetes compared with atrial fibrillation patient without diabetes. I think this is this is statement uh, I should be mentioned because it's a very new statement, very updated, and I think it will be have a strong impact on our uh, clinical practice, especially in atrial fibrillation patient with diabetes. It could be another clue uh, for choosing of the uh, the oral uh, or the, the right NOAC for your patient. Yeah, I think both of you are well stated, you know, and uh, you know, Roxaban, if you look, uh, it's actually covered everything you want to really think about in every field. In every sub analysis, you know, classes, uh, patients. So, um, you know, things which is, you know, you are worried, you know, uh, those with the high chat mass, high has bled in a study. Um, so, I think that's, that's really made us when you come to, to select Rovaxaban much easier because, you know, we are busy physicians. We have, we have no time to go into the trials and, uh, you know, you feel more relaxed to, to use, I think, this medication. So really, I'd like to thank both of you for your effort and making it really practical, I think, and uh, to the point. I'd like to thank the buyer, which is you know, supporting this uh, outstanding practical events. And I hope that the attendees of 200, I think, reached 290 tonight and still with us 256. They were asking about the certificate. You get your certificate, do the evaluation after the session, and you get the certificate with the CME. So until um, next time, Dr. Mohammed Salah, Dr. Mohammed Tarq, and Bayer, thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Abdallah. Thank you for all the attendees. Thank you, Bayer. And I hope that the message become reached clear to the all the attendees. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.